Hey everyone, there's a lot of big news today from Game Informer's latest Taken King article. We didn't get to see any new gameplay footage, but two Game Informer employees that played the new expansion jotted down their thoughts about it and expanded more on some of the stuff that the cool guy talked about in the Reasons to be Excited video. And they also shared some brand new information, like a brand new item from Zer. So let's get right to it. I'm going to give you guys the highlights from the article and give my own thoughts about what they experienced. First off, they talk about how the weapon and armor economy works. Among the many new pieces of gear, you may end up equipping some of the new common gear right away, since it will be even more powerful than current year one items. Game Informer says that we were getting new green weapons that outpowered our best raid gear from year one, even after the first mission. And as we've noted before, the new drop system will try to avoid repeating the same gear, so that you're less likely to get the same item over and over again. But now, if you do get a repeat drop, you can sacrifice it to upgrade other guns that you actually care about, so you don't just need to dismantle everything and basically get nothing in return. You'll be able to do this with legendary and exotic items. I'm really happy about this, because as some of you guys know, I've been collecting icebreakers. I'm up to 17 of them now. Next, they discuss the Dreadnought and one of the new exotics. Essentially, you'll need to collect 50 pieces of it that were scattered across the Dreadnought to put it back together. So that's going to promote exploration, especially because you can't just use your Sparrow to speed through all of it. You'll be checking nooks and crannies and jumping up really high to try and find all these little pieces of the exotics. I can't wait to do that. Game Informer says that there are so many chasms, tight corridors, and battlefields that I think it might feel weird to be zipping around on a speeder bike. And I'm going to agree. One way to make an area feel a lot larger is to reduce the movement speed in that particular area. Also, it'll make us focus on the environment a lot more. They also say that the combat experience is varied. You're running into Hive and Taken, but there's also a bunch of Cabal on board the Dreadnought engaged in their own fight against Oryx's forces. So you could be running through an area and just see a Cabal and Hive battle going on in the distance. I'm both happy and enraged by this. I'm excited to see more Cabal, but... The idea of fighting more phalanx mobs does not appeal to me. I'll get over it though, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. And for everyone asking the question, so what's the point of reaching level 40? They say that there are a lot of quests that don't open up until you hit level 40. Bungie has this structure called the Taken War, which opens up after the initial story missions conclude. So like we talked about before, there's going to be the initial story missions, and then the end game opens up with much more challenging missions and quests. And speaking of light level, here's exactly how it works. You will keep your current level. So if you're level 34 now, you'll be 34 in the Taken King. If you're 22 now, you'll be 22 in the Taken King. Your level going forward will be completely tied to experience though, and not a light value. So once you're finally level 40, you're going to stay there no matter what armor you have. However, light will still be important and add to your overall power. The light value is inherent to all of your gear, from weapons to armor, even starting at level 1. Every activity now has a recommended light total to let you know when you're ready for it. If you're familiar with item level from World of Warcraft, I imagine this is going to be a very similar system. You couldn't do some activities until you got a certain item level of gear to make sure the fights weren't impossible for you. Next up, ghost shells. As you all know, there's going to be new ghost shells, but we learned today that some of these can actually provide a boost to our light and gear stats, such as intellect. Game Informer says that sometimes these shells might offer a choice to boost intellect, discipline, or strength, and you have to choose which boost has a value for your current build. The ghost shells also sometimes have cool effects, like the ability to sense nearby spin metal or other resources. There was even a perk that offered increased glimmer from killing Hive. So obviously our new North Ghost will be much more useful, and there will be a real incentive to try and collect them all. Next up, they talk about the new stuff in the tower, starting off with a reminder about the kiosks. They don't mention a ship kiosk, but I'm hopefully that'll come too, because I have a lot of ships that I want to start collecting, but I can't because of inventory. And next, I really can't wait for this, the gunsmith now has a reputation meter, and a new arms day system. He'll basically give you a weapon to test, and by testing enough weapons, you'll gain reputation levels. Once you hit a certain reputation tier, you can order arms day weapons. These are special legendary weapons from one of the foundries that you can pick up on a certain day of the week. So, with all this new gear, you might be wondering about all the different currencies we have. Well, Bungie is trying to streamline it all, again. 
Vanguard marks and Crucible marks have been replaced by Legendary marks as the main way to purchase Legendary gear. Also, an item called Armor Materials replaces the three class specific items, so it's easier to earn materials on one character and then use them to upgrade a different character. The Vanguard Quartermaster offers an option for trading in class specific materials for the standard armor materials, so the transition should be painless. I think this is great because my hunter has about 4,000 of his materials and my titan and warlock have maybe 200 combined so I can't wait to finally be able to upgrade some of the armor that I've been saving or just some of the new armor that I'm going to get. And they end off the tower section of the article by revealing a brand new item from Xur, the Three of Coins. You'll buy this boost to get a bigger chance of an exotic drop on the next boss you fight. So this is actually kind of exciting, primarily because we normally don't get exotic drops from bosses at all. Maybe in a nightfall and the end boss of the two raids, but that's it. It's always been really frustrating to me not to have some sort of immediate, tangible reward for defeating the toughest enemies of the game, besides at the end of the reward screen. At the end of a 20 minute strike with a final boss that takes at least 5 minutes to kill, to see that boss dissolve only to reveal basically nothing, it hurts and I'm glad this is changing. At this point, the article transitions into strikes and how they're improving. Not only will the enemies be varied, but even dialogue will change. Game Informer says at any given stage of the strike, we were told that Bungie has set up two or even three different encounters that could show up. Maybe it's a fight against the Cabal one time, and a fight against the Taken the next time. Ammo spawns and even stationary turrets show up at new different places. They've even recorded multiple versions of the dialogue so that on a subsequent run at any given strike, you might get new tidbits of lore. I think this is really great because at least for a while it'll promote you running these strikes over and over again so you can learn a little bit more about the story. For the long term though we'll just have to see how it pans out. Hopefully it'll make chain running a lot of these strikes a little bit more bearable by adding up some randomness in there. Bungie is also working on ways to curb AFK issues including teleporting people forward into the fight if you're too far behind. Next up they discuss some of the new strike encounters. In Echo Chamber, the timed PlayStation exclusive strike, you'll fight the restorative mind on Venus, which is basically a giant Vex machine surrounded by a rotating energy shield. You'll have to jump behind cover to dodge the massive energy blasts, but you can't hide for too long because it'll be a harmful rotating shield. One person is going to be running an arc core between different pillars in order to make the boss vulnerable, so there's going to be a lot of movement, and it sounds like it get chaotic if you don't talk to each other. They emphasize that the bosses are less bullet spongy than in many of the original strikes, but it will require you to take on more challenging scenarios and raid light mechanics. There's also the Sunless Cell, which we got a glimpse of in the most recent interview video. You'll face Darkblade, a beefed up hive knight in total darkness, and the strike itself focuses on hive politics and lore. The hive once had a sort of civil war, and the Darkblade led the rebellion against Oryx, along with his pal Varric. When Oryx defeated Darkblade, he imprisoned him in the Sunless Cell, so basically we're going to take the Darkblade out before he rises up. Now here's something really interesting. Strike matchmaking is being changed to cater to the new light system. The Vanguard Legacy Strike playlist is a list of all the strikes from Vanilla Destiny, Dark Below, and House of Wolves. Vanguard Ursa is a list of random heroic strikes that will reward players with legendary marks and legendary engrams, and Marmoset is a list of strikes pulled from the Taken King. Also, Nightfall strikes will now have hand-picked modifiers by Bungie. I definitely like the changes that are coming to the strike playlist, however the Nightfall strikes, those have been on kind of a rotating list for quite a while, so in a sense nothing's really going to change there unless they're going to hand-pick them week to week and then never do the same ones over. We'll have to wait and see on that one. Alright, so enough about PvE, let's talk about PvP. One map we haven't seen gameplay of yet is called Vertigo, located on a floating structure hanging over Mercury. It's got a one-way teleporter as well, similar to what we've seen on Crossroads. They also talk about a new mode that we haven't seen footage of yet called Zone Control. I think this is going to be extremely fun, especially for the objective-focused players out there. Essentially, it'll be control, but you get no points from kills, so you'll only win by claiming the zone. And along with the modes that we already know about, they confirm that Salvage will actually be a permanent mode now, which is a great touch. 
They end off the PvP section by saying that there are a ton of new bounties. There are dedicated bounties for your class each day. Fireteam bounties to complete with your friends, featured playlist bounties, Trials of Osiris bounties, and even weekly bounties that will come with big rewards. It's safe to say that you won't be running out of bounties unless you're playing all day, every day. I'll put that statement to the test. And that about wraps it up. They discussed a few things that we had covered extensively in the past, so I don't want to spend too much time on that, but definitely check out their article if you want to read it all. They ended off by talking about value, which we have a complete article on as well, and I encourage you guys to go check that out. So I'd love to know what you guys think about everything we know so far. Do you personally think that this is going to be worth $40? It's important to be skeptical and set expectations accordingly, but everything that I've seen so far looks pretty polished. But again, there's nothing wrong with holding off and not pre-ordering if you want to see what the reviews are like a few weeks after it's been released. Personally, the way Destiny has gone, I wouldn't fault you for that. Anyway, that's about all of it. Thanks for watching, guys. This has been Patrick Casey with Planet Destiny, your guide to the Destiny universe.